I met her in a club down in North Soho, where you drink champagne and it tastes just like cherry cola. C-O-L-A, cola. Welcome to the video. That obviously is the Kinks, Lola from Top of the Pops. I've enhanced the video to HD. Isn't that exciting? Let's get straight into this. What were the roots of pub rock? The roots of pub rock were multiple. I don't agree, as you know, with what everybody says. I've looked at online, I've read Will Virtue's book. I've read a book called Before It Went Rotten, which I could highly recommend, by the way, as I can Will Virtue's book. But I don't agree with everything that everybody says because I have my own view. I was there, I was part of it all, and I was more in the second wave, which is the 1980s, but I was still around in the, in the 1970s. It's, you can't really put things into categories. It's very difficult to do. Real life is not like that. There's all sorts of strands of grey. You start off, you had pubs. Pubs in London were a place where people went. It was the Cockney sing-along type thing. You know, you often had people playing the piano, you had entertainers. This went on since the dawn of time. I'm sure that they had troubadours in inns back in the day before they had pubs sort of thing. But anyway, in London in particular, you had lots of pubs on every street corner. Not so much now, but this is what it was like then. And so when pub rock starts, there always were bands playing in pubs. Let's talk about one particular band. And the Kinks, who were great influence on one strand of the pub rock world, because pub rock wasn't a style of music, it was a thing that happened. And you had the Kinks, who started off playing famously in a pub called the Chris Old Arms. So the idea that pub rock started on a certain date in May 1971 at the Tally Ho is, I think, erroneous. That's a good place to hang your hat. I know that that was when Dave Robinson got involved and he really, the guy from Stiff, it wasn't only him, but he was one of the catalysts that got the whole pub rock thing started. And he went and he spoke to Irish landlords and different pubs and he got them to put on live music because he saw there was a market for it. And there was a market because like bands like The Kinks, which I've mentioned, The Who started off playing in pubs. The Rolling Stones started off playing in pubs. I'm cold, hit and run. Reaper. Yeah. Small faces even started off playing in pub. So there was a strong tradition of British, well, London in particular, bands playing in pubs. So when the pub rock thing started, it wasn't like this oh, fantastic new thing, we've never seen anything like this. It was just a, an expansion, a continuation of what would, had already happened. As I said, it wasn't a particular form of music. There were all types of bands playing in pubs, especially during the 80s, but in the 70s too. There were rock bands of every description. There was reggae, there was folk influenced bands, you name it, you could probably see it. Ian Jury came out of the art rock movement, which came out of people like the Bonzo Dog, which are remembered as like a comedy thing, but it was more than that. It was like an art, they were all art students and Sam Spoons, who was Martin Ash, which is he was really known. He was a lecturer at Chelsea School of Art and all the guys into art. And it was like an art movement as much as anything else. And that's where Ian Jury and the Blockheads came out of all that. Hit me, hit me, hit me. Hit me with your rhythm stick. But there were other bands too, you see. There were a lot of things happening in the whole of the British music scene. And then you got another strand which started from the London bands like The Who, the Kinks, the Small Faces, people like that, who basically told a story in their songs and, and were, in a way, theatrical. And of course, that came on from bands from the north who came out of London, like the Beatles and the Mersey Boom and all that, and the bands from Scotland. It was just, London was just the place where it would all happen, because London always has been. They talk about New York being the melting pot, but London is the absolute melting pot. People come from all over the world to London, and it's a fantastic place, and they get inspiration from each other. They usually cohabit peacefully, and it's like, I really like London, but I also like Ramsgate, where I live now, but London is like a place where things happen. Ramsgate, mm, yeah, things happen in Ramsgate, but a bit more slowly, shall we say? It's a lot smaller for one thing. Just to say, at this point, if you like this video, please like it, subscribe, comment, tell me what you think. Am I a twit? Am I a whatever? 
Tell me in the comments. Actually, don't do that, because I, I get very upset if people keep saying that I'm a bit of a twit. I'm worse, but if you say nice things, I really like that. Or say interesting things, tell other people your story, and subscribe. Have I said that? Probably. Anyway, let's get back to pub rock. There more strands from across the water. You had the R&B blues cycle. All the pub rock bands of the 70s, like Dr. Phil, Good, and a lot of bands from South End and Eddie and the Hot Rods, and the Curzel Flies to a certain extent, and a lot of bands from London, like the Inmates, who might have been a bit late. There were lots of bands doing blues and R&B, and that all came from, obviously, stuff like this. <laughs> And then you had British Warts. So every record was the band that really started it. And I'm not going to say they weren't, because Dave Robinson was their manager. So he has a right to say whoever he wants started Pub Rock. But I think he knows, as well as I do, that it wasn't just like a binary thing. But British Warts, they got their influence from people like Hoko and Flying Burrito Brothers and Country Rock things. Because back then, there wasn't the internet, let's forget that. I used to walk around at Soho, say. Not at night, obviously, please, I mean. I'm not looking for Lola. Got the lots of record shops around the place. And that's where you pick up external things, because the guys that run the record shops were genuinely enthusiasts, and they would like introduce you to music you perhaps hadn't heard, and you listened to radio, and the BBC back in the early 70s had got its act together a bit. At radio One was 90% pop with Tony Blackburn and stuff like that, and people like me didn't really like all that. But there was good stuff like The Kinks, Lola, that was played on there, and The Small Faces, things like that, but most of it was like not very good. But there were nighttime programs of people like Pete Drummond and John Peel and people like that, and it wasn't just John Peel, I know he's got the lion's share, but Pete Drummond influenced me a lot more than John Peel did. The truth is, here's something you're not gonna like, this is true though, John Peel, basically, he was a business. I knew him slightly, we, we did a few things together from time to time, and he basically was paranoid about doing things that people wouldn't like. John Peel, whose name was something Ravenscroft, wasn't it? He created his own name, He created and he created a character. John Peel, the guy that you heard in the radio and stuff, was not the same guy that, you, that sat at home drinking his wine. He invented himself to a certain extent, and he basically was very careful about what he recommended, and he was um, not as into the music, perhaps, as you might think. I think he was more into projecting it all and telling people about it. So anyway, let's not get into John Peel. This is not about John Peel. So you had the pub rock thing, which came from all those different strands. So you had the bands were influenced by all sorts of things. The pubs came from this. You had the art movement. The punk thing came out of the pub rock game and the new wave. And there was a bit of influence from the States, like people like the Stooges and stuff. But it wasn't as big as the Americans might like to think. Because we had our own things like that. We had, I mean, I know it sounds stupid, but Screamy Lord Soul was going from the late 50s. He created a lot of the norms which became normal later. He did a theatrical show on stage. I've done a video about Screaming Lord Soul, I'll put a link in up there if you want to watch that. But basically, there were all sorts of influences, and what came out of it was the pub rock boom that we saw in the 1970s and 1980s. And I'll do more videos about this if you want me to. If you don't, comment, let me know either way. And I'll see you next time. And thank you for watching. And I'm sorry if you were bored. And I'll try and do better next time. Thank you. Goodbye.